everyone, Ben Cooper Radio, episode number 167. So it's about time we got a guest that's previously been on the show and dropped some really, really cool information. Um, so last time this guest was on the show, we talked a lot about training, very much from a research perspective. It's been a little while since we've had a scientist on the show talking about nuts and bolts, you know, people that are in laboratories doing cool stuff um, rather than people like me uh, spouting rubbish online on things like podcasts. Um, so welcome back on the show, Dr. J- uh, Dr. Jacob Wilson. Hello. Hey, Ben. Great to see you, man. I'm real excited about the show. The last one was awesome. And we got a lot of cool feedback, actually, uh, from you guys listening out there. We appreciate that. Mate, that is uh, it's very true, uh, and it's just amazing that we're able to spread a message so easily uh, to people through mediums like this. Um, just to give people a recap, because people might have come into the show not having listened to the last one, uh, we very much talked about the science of training, what you guys are doing in terms of hypertrophy, movement, muscular activation. So if you haven't watched that show, go back and listen to it, because it is fascinating. Um, Jacob, just... Quickly, tell everyone who you are and what you do. Absolutely. Just real quickly. So um, basically, um, I'm a scientist here at uh, University of Tampa. We do uh, research 24-7 on basically how to optimize things like power, strength, uh, body composition. And we try and look at all the topics that people, you know, that, that everyone's talking about, like in the forums or all the athletes are saying, I wonder if this will work with me. So we test all sorts of things like periodization variables, training variables, nutrition variables. And the one thing that's unique about us is that we don't just use convenient populations. We try and study you guys listening, like the people who are in the gym day in, day out grinding, as opposed to just convenient populations like, well, someone who's going to grow doing leg extensions, three sets of 15, right? So that's kind of what we do. We have all the technology to look at protein synthesis, muscle muscle hypertrophy, get looking from the bone to the top of the connective tissue, uh, measures of power, strength, you know, rate of force development, all the cool stuff. You know, it's like a it's like a big playground for <laughs> studying, you know, training adaptation here. It's good, uh, mate. It's fascinating. And if I had a, a little laboratory on the side of my house, I'd probably be doing the same thing. But then. Uh... <laughs> Where would I have the time to be doing all this podcast and then everything else? That is the fine balance of life. Um, and yes. you must be in, entrenched in this stuff all the time. Um, so because the last podcast is very much training based, I want to get into your nutrition side of your research as well. Because it is something that you are equally as interested in. You're doing some very cool stuff. And before we went on air, you've got some really exciting stuff coming coming up. And I loved it how you're basically, you're looking at the fitness industry right, right now and what we talk about, what's on trend, what people are like trying to discover themselves and it's hard to do from a research perspective because of the time implications, uh, the populations that you need, stuff like that. Um, so uh, one of the things we're gonna, I'm going to dive in and talk about now, um, intermittent fasting is something that has been massive in the past, like Four or five years ago, Martin Birkin was going crazy on this stuff. He was kind of probably the big guy that that was talking yeah. the most about it and being heard. And, you know, everyone started doing intermittent fasting. Every man and his dog was doing it. I was doing it. We were all trying yeah. it out. And then it sort of, you know, everyone did it for getting lean. And then people wanted to try and build muscle again. They were like, oh, well, it's not as good to build muscle and etc. Yeah. Where are you sitting with this whole intermittent fasting thing at the moment? Because I know you're about to engage in some research on it. Yeah, absolutely. So it's one of those things like everything you made a perfect depiction of where we're at on it, right? And it's one of those things because you grow up with like bodybuilding and stuff like that. And it's like, you know, you got to eat every two to three um, hours, you got to stoke the furnace, you know, and stuff like that. And I'm not saying that meal frequency is not a tool because it absolutely could be. But this whole concept of lowering meal frequency is like, it's almost shocking, you know? And so it receives a lot of negative kickback because like, there's no way you could grow on this. There's no way you could optimize body composition. This does, isn't fasting going to hurt your metabolism or aren't you aren't going to starve when you, when you do this? So a guy, a new guy came in our lab, Sam, actually last semester, he, he was really pumped up about this. And the cool thing about when guys come to our lab, 
when even if I don't agree with something, if they present a case that's very intriguing, I'm like, you know what, guys, let's like test this out. And so I think what we become fascinated with is, and a lot of our guys have been doing like more uh, testing on themselves on on the intermittent fasting, and just a lot of stuff like that. And what basically what we're seeing is that like it seems like you're actually less hungry. <laughs> it's just it's the craziest mm-hmm. thing, but like you don't eat in the morning and you kind of wait till the afternoon and you almost forget to eat. It's one of those things where, and I think that's one of the most powerful parts of it is like the satiety component. Mm. Now our lab next semester is actually going to test in a resistance strain model um, where we actually control for calories um, and stay tuned for this guys. Well, you guys will be the first to know, but basically we're going to actually do like an eight to 10 hour fast versus a um, four to six, excuse me, not fast, eight to 10 hour feeding period versus a four to six hour feeding period versus a whole day and we're going to control for calories that will let us know basically is it the calories is it the fasting or maybe people aren't as hungry on the fasting and it is the calories but if you can control your uh actual you know how hungry you are that's going to be a big deal the other thing people want to know is what if you're training in a fasted state and you're not eating is it going to make you lose muscle we don't know and so um, what I can tell you is from the st- a lot, most of the studies have been in Ramadan. Mm-hmm. And they don't really control for calories in the Ramadan fasting. But as you guys know, with Ramadan, basically, uh, you'll have athletes, and they basically can't eat when the sun's up, right? The sun goes down, they can eat. <clears throat> but what you find in those studies is that when uh, um, they don't lose muscle during that time. So that's why we want to see what happens when we control things, actually. And... Uh, We'll, we'll, we'll let you guys know, but I think there are some definite benefits from it. You mentioned uh, having people train in a fasted state and seeing mm-hmm. if there's any muscle mass loss. Now, I take it that a fasted state, you mean literally nothing, just kind of maybe water, maybe some kind of fluid that has no calories because it's obviously very popular for people to take and train with BCAAs to, mm-hmm. in theory, augment any potential muscle loss will or will you not be using BCAs? Great question. Actually, we're going to, uh, after this talk, I'm going to have a meeting with the guys in our lab about this very question. The thing is, here's the thing. It's like you have this paradigm where you're doing a study and you have the scientific world and they're like, well, if you give BCAs, they weren't intermittent fasting. And then you have the practical world, which is millions of people. And you have this small sect of scientists we're like, well, it's got to be laboratory. It's got to be laboratory. But how does a laboratory apply <laughs> to real society? Because that's really, to me, what matters. Mm. And I know with me, like, personally, if I'm doing intermittent fasting, I just don't feel right <laughs> without, like, having something when I train, you know, like BCAs. And if it's, like, 30 calories, you're still, in my mind, like, you're still pretty much fasting, mm. right? So we're going to go back uh, and forth point by point and go, okay, what's the, what should we do here, guys? Um, one of the thoughts I have is I do think that having BCAs before, like modified, is going to be good to do. So that's where I'm leaning right now is, is giving BCAs before an fasting. You've tried intermittent fasting, you said. Yeah, I've done it for quite a long period of time. Yeah, yeah. And so tell me, what do you do during the, the I did the classic 16-8 model by Martin Burkham. Um, if I trained before... Uh, so I trained during the fast, I would take BCAAs um, or potentially EAAs. Now I know that is another argument entirely um, between the two different types of or struct- uh, amounts of amino acids. Um, and then, I, I mean, I largely used it from a lifestyle perspective. I was just, you know, working, training, not training too hard, uh, trying to get leaner. So it, for me, it's that is the perfect situation for intermittent fasting. It's either fat loss or lifestyle, you know, just being fit and healthy and having a flexible approach to your nutrition. Um, mm-hmm. That's where I saw the, the, the key benefit. Like right now, uh, I'm playing rugby, hitting the gym, uh, working a lot. You know, I have a very busy lifestyle that demands a pretty heavy diet to recover. So there's just no way I could apply that system of eating into my current situation. Mm-hmm. Yes. And you know what, Ben, I think that's the coolest part is that <clears throat> I see so many people out there, they're like, this is the only way, you know, that my system is the only way, but then you got a guy like you who's out there doing it, practicing it. And you realize, and you're telling everyone out there, you got to adapt 
to the current situation. And I think that's the main point. And that's why when we study this and we see what happens, we can tell the people out there like, guys, this is a tool. If your lifestyle is like this, this is a perfect time to use it. You know what I mean? And I think that's what we're trying to get to with finding this stuff. But personally, I would say I, I'm, we're leaning toward giving BCAs before they train. You know, I think probably taking something else, even like HMB with that could be beneficial as well during the fasting period. Um, so, yeah, that's where we're leading. Pretty much kind of similar to what you did. Okay. Um, why HMB? Only because my knowledge is that HMB is good, but only really in injured athletes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, basically, what we've, we've done some, like, calorie restriction studies. So, back, um, back in my old university, when I was at Florida State. We did some research where we simulated like military missions mm -hmm. and uh, with mice actually, and um, but we had them do calorie restriction, and we found that it staved off muscle loss during calorie restriction. So I think a lot of people will use intermittent fasting for like fat loss purposes, and they'll naturally restrict calories. So we think it might stave off some of the uh, muscle loss. So we saw like, for example, some of the protein breakdown pathways like ubiquitin pathway, went up when you calorie restricted, and it kind of blunted that. So I think what happens is any time protein breakdown goes up, whether it's injury or it's um, calorie restriction, that that helps to preserve the breakdown in muscle tissue. Okay. Now, with your study looking at well, intermittent fasting right now, we've already, what sounds like, listed quite a lot of variables because if you now start putting in BCAs, HMB, because I, I also get that you're trying to apply this to the real world. Like if I was yeah. going to go on an intermittent fasting plan and lean out, I would sit there and go, well, I'm going to do the diet, but I'm obviously going to try and augment as much muscle loss and everything else. So I'll take BCAs and I'll take HMB and I'll train in this way. Yeah. Whereas, you know, I know that you're trying to get to that. You're trying to find the best applicable situation. So does that mean you're going to have populations of people that will – not take BCAs and not take HMB, but take BACAs and take HMB or take them both together and then take, could you not start to have lots of different groups of uh, people? That, yeah, you can. That's the problem. Um, so I think what we would do is start with, we'd start with a basis. If we want BCAs, to be honest, we would give, if we have three groups where it's an eight hour um, eating period, the four hour eating period versus you can spread your calories out, we give all subjects BCAs. So at least, they're all getting that same treatment. So the only thing that's different is the fasting periods. Mm -hmm. And then, but in future studies, um, it, we might um, actually look at BCAs versus not BCAs. Or if we do this study without BCAs, maybe we throw in one extra group mm -hmm. with BCAs. So it's kind of debating like resources versus uh, what we get accomplished in one semester. Because the, right now, the two questions we have is, well, one main question we have is, what's the optimal feeding period or what's the optimal period of time? Is it uh, eight hours? Is it four hours? But another major question we all have is this BCA question. So do we throw in another group to look at that, right? Um, so that's what we're thinking and weighing out. And if not, it'd be something we need to do the next semester. Because sure. you, like you pointed out, you just what you just pointed out is, what we're facing right now is, well, wow, it's like we almost have six or seven different group studies mm. that we really can look at. But that's the problem with research, yeah. isn't it? And that's why these yeah. things take so long. You've got to establish one factor, then you tie in another yeah. factor. And, you know, that's why people make assumptions in fitness. And I, I get, I totally get the argument that we need to follow and appreciate the scientific methods and what the science discovers. But there has to be periods of time where people sit down and make honest assumptions about what seems logical with what we know about physiology and biochemistry because otherwise we'd, we'd really get nowhere without 100%. taking an, an educated, assumptive approach. Yes, 100%. Because really, with your research, you're making assumptions and trying to prove it either correct or incorrect. So you're 100%. still making an assumption right now. Yeah, without a doubt. And that's the issue that you come up with. So is it all the assumptions you have to make in order to come up with a good design. I just hope people appreciate that. Um, right, so let's move on to something that you've actually studied. We're now talking mm -hmm. about the hypothetical in the future. Um, yeah. This is something that, again, I've used in myself. There's not, I don't think there's a diet concept that I haven't tried, and that's just me being a geeky 
person and also because I have to educate other people on this and the dynamics of these things. But ketogenic dieting is something that has come in and out of fashion repeatedly. Um, and it's been called different things. I think one of the earliest methods was the anabolic diet by um, uh, but Joe, Joe's, oh, what's his name? I know who you're talking about. <laughs> oh, I've pulled a blank. Pascal, Pasquale, anyway, yeah. Uh, and then it's, um, you know, you had uh, John Kiefer developed Carb Night, which was basically a ketogenic diet. And then just other people have, 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 yeah. have packaged this in different ways. And when, when you look at it, you know, there, there almost seems like, again, that you could draw some conclusions. People started to say, well, you know, it kind of puts you in this fat turnover state, but then really it ultimately a lot of the time comes down to calories. And then there's this kind of, um, I know that there's certain athletic institutions currently studying a low carbohydrate state for adaptive training benefits, which is very interesting. I started to do some work with some English rugby clubs and they were training a lot of their guys explosively in low carb states and then leaving the feed refeeding periods for like <clears throat> rest days, for example, which is fascinating. Yeah. Um, but from a performance perspective, in a nutshell, it doesn't make sense. It's carb restricted and we need carbs to train. So yeah. hit hit me with where you're at with ketogenic dieting and what's evolved from your side. Yeah, so first off, um, just for the guys out there who aren't really sure about ketogenic dieting, like you pointed, there's a million different ones out there. So I think, I guess one thing we would say is a ketogenic diet is something that puts you into a state of nutritional ketosis, which to be honest, we're having a hard time defining right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I have some issues with the current definitions. But let's just say, for the sake of things, that, keto, that a state of being keto-adapted, that diet makes you keto-adapted, would mean that your body is shifting its fuel source to primary utilize fat and ketones as its primary fuel source. That's the general definition. Um, so basically, I want to start with how the diet generally is structured. A lot of times people go, oh, I ketogenic diet. And, and I'll ask them, well, what, okay, tell me what that did. And they go, oh, it didn't work. And I, I felt horrible. Okay, well, tell me how long you did it. Well, I did it for like five days. Well, first thing we go is there's an adaptation period. We know it takes at least like two weeks to, for your body to adapt. So that would make sense if they felt horrible. Because your mainly your main source of fuel is usually carbs. So it's like, well, now I'm using fat as fuel. So the second thing, what diet actually does that? I go, well, what was your diet? Well, I just ate a bunch of protein. Right, like Greek yogurt and you know, like and whey protein, and I calculate their macros. I'm like, wow, you pretty much ate 30 percent fat and like 50, you know, 60 percent protein or something like that. That wasn't a ketogenic diet because that much protein can get converted over to, to glucose. So, um, and your body can get good at that. So, a ketogenic diet is typically 70 to 75 percent fat, 20 to 25 percent protein, and maybe five to 10 percent carb, depending on how. Uh, how much you're training. So and people are like, well, 70, 75% fat. Yeah. So we're talking about salami, bacon, you know, blue cheese, cream cheese, um, you know, things of that nature, <clears throat> fatty cuts of meat. So the biggest struggle I had then was saying exactly what you said. It is counter, uh, counterintuitive. When we're doing high intensity movements, we're using carbohydrates as our major fuel source. Well, it turns, and, and where do we get that fuel? We get our glycogen stores. So it turn, here's what turn, happens, um, and this is what blew my mind. And we did this in our lab, basically. We looked recently, and this hasn't been published yet, so you guys out there, this is pretty cool stuff. We actually teamed up with Mike Roberts' uh, lab, and he's in Auburn, and we've been doing a bunch of studies, and we found that actually muscle glycogen, after you're keto adapted, is not significantly different than people on carbs. And I saw that that blew my mind. And I was like, well, what's going on? <clears throat> Come, that was in resistance training. Jeff Volick and endurance athletes found that endurance athletes who were on ketogenic diet had the same amount of glycogen in their muscles as ones who are on high carbs. And this is what's going to blow your mind, the data I saw. He, he showed us. When they were done with a ridiculously long run where they was able to deplete glycogen in both them and the guys on carbs, he gave them a shake that was high fat protein. The other group gave them a high carb group, and they both replenished glycogen to the same extent. 
But what what was that glycogen replenishing period? Because in theory, if I let's say I just ate a ketogenic diet for two or three days, that's going to restore my glycogen over time. But yeah, was, that window is surely hours. different. Yeah, so the, the, they looked at the rate they were replenishing over a few hours, and it was the same. But here's the key. These guys had been ketogenic dieting for like 15 months. Right. So the key is it – so if someone who's listening starts keto right now and they were to give themselves a fat shake, they would be depleted. They continue to stay depleted. But eventually, and I don't know how long that period is, likely months – Likely months, maybe a year. I don't know. Um, what happens is that the body adapts so that I can make glycogen without carbs. And a lot of people ask me, they go, isn't that impossible? I understand. If you have carbs, how can you create glycogen? I go, well, how do you get fat? How come so many people can get fat with low-fat diets? <laughs> your, body, your body can produce. It's just carbons. Your body can take other substrates and make uh, you know, glycogen. And glycogen is such a limited take anyway. Tank anyway. We're talking about like sixteen hundred calories to two thousand calories. Whereas it can make a ton of fat. We have no problem saying someone can add, you know, three thousand five hundred calories of fat with a, on a low fat diet. Sixteen hundred, two thousand calories is not that much, but it's a long adaptation period. It probably could take a couple months before someone can have that glycogen. Um, so that's the interesting thing I would say that we found. Um, <clears throat> what people have done to counter this because they didn't know this until really just recently, they've been doing refeeds, like you pointed out, right? <clears throat> the theory is that you're depleting, depleting, and refeeding. So we actually did a study on this. We took individuals and we, we restricted them of calories. So they lost over eight weeks' time, I want to say about three kilograms of body mass. So we had one group that was ketogenic diet strict keto, one group that was cyclic keto. Now, we, we base it on a lot of the books that are out there where they'll have keto Monday through Friday on the weekends, they carve up. And basically what we ended up finding was that um, the group that was cyclic ketogenic dieting, they lost more muscle. They actually lost, um, I want to say, over two kilograms of lean mass. The keto group lost none. And then we looked at their blood ketone levels. Basically what happened, they were coming in Monday, their ketone levels were super low, and they didn't get back into ketosis till Friday. So by the time they got back into ketosis, you then carb them up again. And they never keto adapted. So what's going on is that basically they never keto adapt, they're staying carb adapted, and Monday you remove their carbs. So they feel miserable five days out of seven almost. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? And so it affected their ability to train. Um, also, remember this. If you're not keto adapted and you go on a Monday, you take away your carbs, your ketones are low. Now your body says, well, I, I need carbs. So what is it going to do? It catabolizes muscle. And so we think that ketones themselves spare muscle. They actually have a muscle sparing effect. So these are some interesting things. And there may be ways to get around that, but that's what we've currently seen in our lab. Okay, so this is all, I suppose, fascinating, and it's great, but where, I mean, where are you seeing the application? Because, you know, in everyday life, the ketogenic diet is the hardest thing to do in the world. Like, if you go out for dinner, you're basically having a steak with salad. Like, that's, that's yeah. what you're getting. So where's the application for you, you and me who are in the gym doing cool shit? Great question. So I would say it's like, it's definitely a lifestyle. And it's a lifestyle that you have to basically what we found is that and um and kind of sell out to it, I guess. Sorry, so you'll we'll have to backtrack ten seconds. I lost you slightly on okay. the signal. So basically what I was saying is that you kind of have to follow the ketogenic diet pretty strictly, like you pointed out. Mm -hmm. And that can limit things that you do. What I always say is I always go it's basically a tool. So, so I usually go on people's taste preferences and sort of lifestyle preferences. So basically, if you have um, an individual and they really, if they go to a restaurant and they normally like the fatty, fatty foods, they're not as much into like the sweets and stuff like that. They'd rather have something like that's fatty and that's better. They think that's better tasting to them and they're not as much as into like the desserts at restaurants. Then I go, oh, well, it's easy for them to make the transition. If you have someone who just loves carbs, they love cereal, they love all the stuff, and 
you know, for them and they can stay lean on that, it's not necessarily a tool for them. One thing I've seen also based on like, so taste preferences are going to determine a lot of it, but also responder analysis. So one thing I think when we look at like memes, when we see people doing studies is some people respond to ketogenic diet very well, others don't. Some people respond to higher carb diets very well, others don't. So it's more like athletes will typically do what they're reinforced to do. So if someone's a great responder to a ketogenic diet, then they'll find they'll find a way to make it work. If someone's like, well, this isn't working any better than when I'm on carbs, well, then I don't really recommend it. You know what I mean? Once you get into the ketogenic lifestyle, then I would say there's things that you can do to make it fun. For example, you can make uh, use low carb flours to make like cookies. You can use you can easily make um, cheesecake, for example, using like macadamia uh, nuts as the crust or almond flour as a crust. Um, so you can get, you can make crackers and stuff like that with like, um, by putting cheese on a plate and baking it. So you can kind of get very creative and learn how to make pizzas, flours, desserts. Um, it just depends on what my thing is. Does it work with you? If it, or what are your taste preferences? And that would be more the applicability. Okay. Um, I'm a hundred percent on board with that. But I've still, for me, got the question in my mind of, you know, I, I'm the same as you. I would work with an individual. I would look at what I, – I go very much on energy as well. I want to try and match a diet to someone's energy. So if they gravitate towards fats, and I'll put them on more fats and vice versa. Mm -hmm. But why would I go to the extreme of the ketogenic diet? Because what you're doing now is researching the benefits. Now – I'm working with someone, for example, that just wants to maybe lean out, build a bit of tissue, look good, perform in the gym. Why go to the extreme of the ketogenic diet, which is 70% fat, when I could go like 45, 55% fat and have their, you know, their diet still fairly fat, fatty because they work well on that, but still mm -hmm. have enough carbs coming in and out to make their diet more sociable. I want to understand if there is a benefit by going to that extreme. That's a great point. So it's a really great point. To be honest, there's you could I say you could make uh, points both ways. With your plan uh, of action, the advantage is that they maintain metabolic flexibility and social flexibility. So meaning that if you look, the one of the things we have found that one let's say we go on a negative on ketogenic diet we found you don't use dietary carbohydrate very well any longer. So that's why like if you were to go out and eat a bunch of cake or something you would store a lot more fat than someone who is like in your situation, your client, who is getting carbohydrates in their diet. Um, you know, one of the ways to counter that is possibly like targeted ketogenic dieting is what like Sean Wells, one of my good friends does, is they'll have like uh, carbs before he trains. We're testing that in the lab. But anyway, I think that there's that being flexible may be beneficial. Why go to the extremes? It depends, really. If you, one thing we have said, the benefits I've seen in ketogenic dieting is it does seem that, to, like, ketones themselves seem to be anti inflammatory. So if you have a client who has, who's got a lot of war injuries, a lot of inflammation from squatting, you know, from taking hits in rugby for years in and years out, or has a history of concussions, um, one of the things we know with concussions is athletes. Uh, don't use glucose very well in their brain after the concussion, and it's harder to recover. So in a sport like rugby, for example, you can use an alternative fuel source, ketones, which actually um, we think has a prehab effect, which means when you actually get the hit, the insult, you don't um, have as much of an insult, and you recover faster. So we think for like our NFL linemen, like American football, where we see so much brain trauma, that the extreme could be good because of the ketones protective effects. So in combat sports, it may be worth it to protect the brain. Um, or in people who have a lot of inflammation because they've been trained for years. Or like you point out, say you have an athlete who's been eating tons of calories for years because you know they're a, they're a football player and they're a lineman, and then they stop playing. So they still want to eat a bunch of fats, and uh, you know they don't really like carbs then it's easier to put them because they're pretty much already on the extreme. But their carbs are probably just high enough to make them fat. So I think there are benefits in both, and it really depends on the situation. Interesting. 
Interesting. <clears throat> right, let's make a... Sec- oh, actually, if, you know, people that are listening to this are going to be thinking, oh, in- ketogenic dieting sounds interesting, I'll look it up. Where, where do you think is the best resource to read up on the ketogenic dieting? Well, so I did a, um, I did an FAQ on ketogenic dieting. Um, it's a, you can look it up like a, on YouTube, ketogenic FAQ, Jacob Wilson, also on bodybuilding.com. I wrote a really extensive FAQ on ketogenic dieting. Like, how do you, uh, it's underneath my, the muscle prof column. Okay. So if you guys look at, at the muscle prof column, I talk a lot about it. Um, where basically I have literally all the hardest questions like, will it kill you? <laughs> you know, uh, what's the best ratios? How do you adapt faster? Um, all these little intricate questions. So I would definitely recommend checking that out. Okay, wicked. Um, so I'm going to want to move on to a different area of research that you've done, um, which is protein overfeeding. Now, this is something that we've actually talked about quite a bit in our company recently so I run a uh, an education company called Body Type Nutrition where we train other personal trainers how to be basically nutritional Jedis and you know one of the big things we do as nutritionists is set protein in the diet protein is a very important factor um, and you know the current research is sort of saying you know around sort of two grams to maybe 3.1 per kilo um, of body mass as a, as a good baseline for an athletic individual and now people are talking about well is this even higher I think uh, there was a recent study where they were having up to about 70 or 80 grams of protein per meal four or five times a day um, and it was showing like greater muscle protein synthesis benefits and it, it kind of indicated that is there a ceiling almost? We because we assumed there was this ceiling. So where do we sit with protein right mm. now? Where where has your research shown you information? Well, I'll tell you what, Ben. Here's the thing: that if you look at the research, we look at like this ceiling effect. A lot of the studies looking at ceiling, I still have the where the, where they use protein synthesis are inherently flawed in the fact that all they are looking at is protein synthesis. That's number one. As if the only thing protein does is stimulate protein synthesis, right? So the, the original studies would look at protein synthesis. They'd see it plateau off at like 20 to 30 grams a meal um, if, you're, if you're not, if you didn't just resist and strain. Mm-hmm. And they would go, and then they would see like oxidation go up, being use, use, use of protein as fuel go up after that. And they go, oh, it's just being used, it's just wasted after that point. So there's no point. Well, they're not taking into account the fact that it has satiety effects. You know, they're not taking into account the fact that it's before it's used as fuel, is it converting to other metabolites? There's a lot of metabolites that protein and amino acids might get converted to that we don't even know the effects of yet. The other thing is, how valid is acute protein synthesis, uh, you know, period? For all these studies we've seen in Journal of Applied Physiology for the last, like, 10 years, now there's studies coming out showing these acute short-term measures of protein synthesis really might not even correlate well at all with long-term muscle growth, which tells us that all those studies need to be redone in resistance strain guys like you and the guy and the people listening over long-term studies. That's the true dose dependent responses that we need. But what I can tell you is like you point out, um, Joey Antonio just did research with, um, with high amounts of, pr- of, of protein where he compared, um, I want to say like 2.1, 2.2 grams per kg of protein compared to like 3.4 grams per kg and a resistance training population. And we found even though they gained similar muscle mass, the group that was on the higher protein group lost two more kilograms of fat over eight weeks time. Now to me, that's what it's all about. You know, I mean, if, if you're gaining muscle and losing fat at the same time, it tells us that protein says it's not the only thing we have to look at. Because m- many people try and gain mass, they gain a bunch of fat at the same time. If I can gain muscle and lose fat, that saves me time having to diet, right? So I think that's the biggest thing that we're seeing is that, like, you're right. Maybe we need more protein. Um, and maybe 3.2 grams could be better than 2 grams, you know? Maybe we should cycle how much, you know, our, our protein intake. And that's an interesting concept right there. I, 
it hasn't been published yet, but I know uh, one researcher, um, he presented it at ACSM, Tipton, found that like when you up protein very high, your body does somewhat adapt to it so that when you lower it back down to lower levels, you could actually lose some muscle, which kind of tells me that, you know, higher protein intakes could be a tool possibly. Um, but if you do it too long, maybe you adapt to it. So maybe even using it as a tool, like I'm going to do a hard, hard training cycle, or I'm going to diet really hard. Now I'm going to use this tool and up my protein to over three grams per kilo, you know? So I think that's what we're finding. Okay. So talking about practical information and advice for the current gym goer right now, what we know, what, 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 how much protein should I eat? Let's just say I'm maintaining my body mass, trying to maybe gain a lean bit of muscle tissue if possible. Where where do I support my diet with the current evidence? I'd say at minimum two grams per kilo. You know, when you're on a normal diet, you're at two grams per kilo. And I would say that if you're trying to diet or you're doing hard training, that you can benefit, for, especially on fit. So for muscle mass, at least 2.2 to 2.2 per kilo. For overall body composition, like fat loss, you can up that to over three grams per kilo. That's what we know from the research. Um, with every meal, you want to try and at least get 30, I'd say 30 to 40 grams of protein at minimum with every meal. And then the other thing I would say that's practical is this. It is very, very hard to store uh, protein as fat. Very difficult. So if you are out there and you just came off a hard dieting period and you're worried about raising your calories up, maybe the first way you should raise your calories up are protein. Because you're gonna, it's almost impossible to store. So what I suggest is instead of like linearly scaling all your macros, when you come out of a hard diet, first introduce a, a macro that is hard to store, like protein. Mm -hmm. That might be a time to get it up to three, four grams per kilogram. Now, now you get your calories back up to normal, and then you can scale it back down as your carbs come back up. So I think those are some practical things that you guys out there could use. Interesting. So almost uh, a reverse diet strategy should be yeah. protein dominant to start with. I think so. And that's the thing, Ben, it's like everyone does this. They're like, oh, well, you know what? Here, uh, you only need 1.8 to 2.0 grams of, of protein per kg. Then you set your fats. You fill in the rest of your calories with carbs. My question to that is why? Why would you just randomly fill in the rest of your calories with carbs? Why not? If you're trying to fill out calories... Why not fill in your calories with a, a source of energy or a source of um, calories that's not going to make you store fat? That's the advantage of protein is you can play with it. Whereas if you up your carbs a, a lot, you'll notice negative outcomes on body composition once you hit a point, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think that's the benefit. Interesting. All right, so the the last thing that I had on my list that I wanted to chat to you about was uh, this this theory that I've he heard you talk about before, which is calorie cycling. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I don't know if it's similar, but I, for one, always promote the fact that if your energy changes on a daily basis in terms of energy out, then your calorie input needs to change. That just makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, what What is your definition of calorie cycling and how can it benefit people? couple different ways. So I would say calorie cycling, as like you put it out, um, is that your calories are going not going to be stable. It's not going to be just normal where it's like every day I eat 2,500 calories, mm -hmm. or, you know, or every day I eat 3,000 calories. They're going to shift in cycle based on the needs of the individual. Like you pointed out, energy output goes up. Your calories might shift to match that. So the needs of the individual and the goals of the individual, uh, which sometimes are synonymous. So, um, the, the, so that's key first is like, like, I, like you pointed out is, especially for body composition purposes, if I'm going to go sit on my behind all day, why would my calories be the same if I'm going to go play rugby, you know, practice, lift weights that day and do sprints? They shouldn't, your calories should match those days. So that's the first application I would say. The second application is for things like fat loss. There's good research out there by um, Davuti, and he, he called, I thought it was real clever of him, he called like calorie cycling, he called it calorie, calorie shifting in his studies. And basically what he had to do is he took individuals and he died them down, I want to say for like uh, 10 or 11 days, they restricted, and then for three days, they ate normal. Um, and then so basically, uh, whereas the other group kept restricting. 
But what you found is basically that group that ate normal for three days, um, they, they, they lost more fat. And when they came out of the diet, their metabolisms were more maintained. So I think, yes. So this is cool stuff. Um, the other thing is that there is some evidence that slight periods of depletion can keep you insulin sensitive. So if someone's bulking, it could be the opposite way. Maybe for 10 days, they're going to uh, have higher calories. And then for two or three days, they let their calories go back down to normal. So they can deplete the muscle so that it keeps things like high amount of mitochondria, high insulin sensitivity. You have to stress it energetically. If you don't, it's going to be like, well, I don't need a lot of mitochondria. Mm. So those are some of the ways I think that it could be used. Mm. That's quite interesting. I've I've never actually seen that research. That's fascinating. I've obviously yeah. lost my finger on the pulse there. Um, yeah. I better I better let the team know. Um, yeah, Davudi. Davudi. Okay. Was that where where was that published? You know. Good question. I'm trying to remember it. I will send you the link. Okay. Uh, awesome. I'll send you the link because he's published a couple different papers. Fascinating. Um, Dr. Wilson, as always, it's a pleasure to speak to you. You've always got a fascinating fascinating into, insight into a load of different things. Um, I'd love for people to be able to find you uh, as a result of this podcast, read a little bit more about what you're writing. I know you put out wicked videos on Facebook and all sorts of stuff. Uh, tell people where to go uh, to find a bit more of your work. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so just to see uh, what's the latest going on in our lab and, and things of that nature, um, our handle on Instagram, on Twitter, and on Facebook is at the Muscle Prof. So at the Muscle Prof, and also like uh, all, most of our articles are underneath the Muscle Prof. So definitely, if you guys check that out, and we'll do a lot of live questions and answers with you guys. And uh, yeah, we appreciate I appreciate being on the show, man. It's, it's my to be honest, like my favorite show. It's awesome. So uh, <laughs> keep up the great work, man. Um, guys, honestly, uh, Dr. Wilson does put out some really, really cool stuff, um, all over the place. Um, and more than anything, I think what you do is just try to get people to think. And I think as a researcher, you're balanced from the perspective that you're always saying to yourself, you know, this could be the best way to do it right now. And, and it might not be. And I know research is about that, but not enough researchers seem to give that impression and that energy to people. And that's why I brought up the point earlier of about, you know, research before it's done is just assumptions. We're just assuming stuff could happen in a certain way. And hopefully we, we, we get some hard data on it. And if not, we question ourselves, we go back to the drawing board and we start again. Um, so I, I just think that's a great and uh, fresh perspective to have in fitness because sometimes there is an awful lot of people that are very cut and dry, research this, research that, and they're like, well, just hang on a second, okay? <laughs> right, again, thank you very much for being on the show. Um, thank you, Ben. Guys, if you've enjoyed this show, please just jump on Twitter, jump on Instagram, Facebook, tag us in, let us know, especially on Twitter. It's a good way to just tag us both in the post, say, you know, I enjoyed the show. I've got a question. Where do I go to read about this? Have you got a link about something? Look, we will help if you will ask us. We're here to share information. Um, but I will see you all on the next show. I'll be back with Rachel. And then the week after that, we'll have another amazing guest. So that is goodbye from me. Later, guys. See you later. Hey everyone, Ben Cooper Radio, episode number 166. Now, I think on the last episode, uh, I bigged myself up and said that my maths was good, I'd got an abacus for Christmas, and uh, I'd sort of nailed the numbers, and then I think I got it wrong. 